Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 70, Space Shuttle Flight 3, STS-3. Plasma Trails and Dusty Landings. Before we get started, I have another minor correction. It seems this is becoming a standard feature of the show. But as long as the corrections stay this small, I'll be fine with that. On the previous episode, I talked about how STS-2 carried the first classified payload of the shuttle program, and there was an amusing moment when the crew had to open the safe and pull out a classified checklist, which told them to be sure to put the checklist back in the safe. Well, the story is accurate, but it actually was on STS-4, so it seems I jumped the gun a bit. I promise I won't tell the story again next episode. Last time, we talked about STS-2. Joe Engel and Dick Truly became NASA's last all-rookie crew when they flew a used spacecraft into orbit for the first time. The mission was cut short due to a bulky fuel cell, but the determined crew went into overdrive mode and managed to complete over 90% of their mission objectives. Most noteworthy of those objectives was evaluating the remote manipulator system, aka Canadarm, aka Big Robot Arm in the back of the shuttle. The crew did not perform any grapples or cargo movement, but paved the way for future missions to further put the arm through its paces. The STS-2 mission that flew did not always resemble the STS-2 mission on the drawing board. The same goes for STS-3, and I believe all of the missions all the way up to STS-5. That's because a unique mission was in the works for the early shuttle era. Its exact timing was flexible, hence the mission number floating around, but its destination was known for sure. America's first orbiting outpost, Skylab. The Apollo-era space station had been left largely inert ever since its final crew, Skylab 4, departed in early 1974. As you'll recall, Skylab performed well, but also sort of limped across the finish line. Due to a malfunction during launch, it never had the planned power generation or thermal properties, but three crews wrung every drop of science possible out of the station. By the end, it was low on critical consumables, attitude control gyroscopes were failing, and cooling systems were leaking. Despite all that, there were still a few good reasons to return to Skylab. First, there was a thought that there could be much learned by reactivating the station, if only for a short time. It's not every day that you have a chance to practice restoring old space hardware, and that's a handy skill to have. Why launch new stuff if you can repair what's already there? Second, the Skylab 4 crew had left a sort of time capsule behind in the multiple docking adapter. The idea was that studying its contents after several years in an unpressurized environment in space would lead to useful insights. I don't know the exact contents of the time capsule, but if I understand correctly, it was basically just a plastic bag full of random things from the station that might react differently to long-term space exposure. So even if the station wasn't reactivated, popping in to snag the time capsule would yield a lot of useful data. And third, Skylab was a big giant piece of metal that would come crashing down in an uncontrolled entry if nothing was done. So even if the station wasn't reactivated, and even if no one opened up the MDA to grab the time capsule, there was still a desire to rendezvous with Skylab in order to attach a propulsion module to it in order to perform a controlled entry. That said, there were also some reasons not to visit the old station. Skylab was launched in 1973, but was based on Apollo, a spacecraft from the 1960s, which itself was based on a lot of tech from the 1950s. If the station was successfully reactivated, NASA would find itself in the 1980s, stuck with a relic from the past. And if it actually worked, it would be tough to justify ditching it just because it was old. So there was a danger that NASA's forward momentum might be somewhat stalled by the onus of caring for an out-of-date space station. Whether a functional Skylab was a boon or a hindrance was sort of up to interpretation. But at the end of the day, the opportunity was just too good to pass up, so mission designers got to work on a rescue flight. The proposed mission called for a unique piece of hardware, the Teleoperator Retrieval System, or TRS. This was essentially just a docking port, some cameras, some rocket engines, and a bunch of fuel tanks. I mean, it was obviously more sophisticated than I make it sound, but you get the idea. The shuttle potentially could have docked directly with Skylab, but there were concerns about performing orbit changes in that configuration. After all, it's not like Skylab and the shuttle were designed to work together while firing engines. 
Instead, the TRS would be deployed from the shuttle payload bay and remotely piloted by the crew who would steer it towards a multiple docking adapter on Skylab. Once docked, the station could either be boosted to a higher orbit, saving it, or it could be safely deorbited over the ocean where no one would get hurt. What I find fascinating about the TRS is this sounds a lot like the space tug that NASA had been eyeing for years. Originally envisioned as a central part of the sprawling space transportation system, space tugs would be tasked with moving satellites to different orbits, helping to deliver supplies to space stations, and deorbiting old satellites. That vision never happened, but it sounds like the TRS would have gotten pretty close. The shuttle Skylab mission would have been flown by Apollo 13 Lunar Module pilot Fred Hayes, along with approach and landing test pilot Gordon Fullerton, marking Hayes' second flight and Fullerton's first. Since it was a pretty complex flight involving rendezvous, new hardware, and potential docking, the hope was to fly it essentially as late as possible, giving folks more time to better understand the shuttle. Unfortunately, as late as possible, began to slide to the left on the timeline. In the late 1970s, solar activity increased, which sort of fluffed up the upper atmosphere, increasing drag for satellites. At the same time, the space shuttle program hit development troubles and began to slip its schedule to the right. So the date of Skylab's uncontrolled entry moved earlier and earlier, while the date of the first space shuttle flight moved later and later. At some point, those two dates waved as they passed each other, and that was the end of that. As we learned a while back, Skylab returned to Earth in an uncontrolled re-entry in July of 1979, and the shuttle's visit to Skylab faded away to the fascinating realm of unflown shuttle missions. Perhaps disheartened by the cancellation of the mission and the slipping timelines, or perhaps just ready to move on, Fred Hayes departed NASA shortly afterwards, going on to a successful career on the business side of aerospace. Okay, that was a lot about what didn't happen on STS-3. So what did happen? STS-3 was the third of the orbital test flight missions and would continue to evaluate the space shuttle as well as its major subsystems. The planned seven-day flight would especially focus on continuing to evaluate the Canadarm as well as several scientific payloads. As mentioned earlier, the STS-2 Canadarm tests basically just made sure that the thing worked at all. They took it out of its cradle, waggled it around, tested the cameras, and made sure that the controls worked as expected. On this flight, the crew would actually grapple items in the payload bay, move them around, and put them back, a critical capability for future flights. The payloads that would be moved around were also made with an eye towards the future. With so many experiments planned on future shuttle missions, it was really important to understand just what sort of environment they would be operating in. Now, you might think this would be an easy answer. Hey guys, your environment is space. But as usual, it's not quite that simple. If you take something from Earth and put it into space, a bunch of things are going to happen to it. One is we'll start doing something called outgassing. You're probably actually familiar with this concept on Earth. You know that new car smell? That's outgassing. The new plastic is still emitting byproducts from the manufacturing process, and it takes a while for it to settle down. But in space, instead of getting a new car smell, you get a very, very thin cloud of gas and particles sort of wafting out of the material. And this gas could potentially get into sensitive instruments or coat delicate optics and stuff like that. For a lot of satellites, mission controllers can just wait until this outgassing period is finished before doing anything delicate. But shuttle missions were pretty short, so waiting around wasn't really ideal. With that in mind, there were a number of experiments dedicated to learning more about what the payload bay environment was like on a typical mission. One of these instruments, the Contamination Monitor, was among the first shuttle payloads from the Goddard Space Flight Center. Since Goddard is all about Earth science and space science, I'm sure that they had plans for a number of systems that involved carefully calibrated optics. So it was important to know what might get on those lenses. Another payload from Marshall Space Flight Center contained 10 instruments dedicated to sniffing around and figuring out what might be in space in the vicinity of the orbiter. And this was one of the payloads that would be moved around by the robotic arm, giving it a chance to study the environment near different parts of the orbiter. 
Another experiment dedicated to calibrating the shuttle environment was the microabrasion foil experiment. This one was less concerned about what the shuttle was doing to space, and more about what space was doing to the shuttle. It was essentially just a bunch of strips of aluminum foil of varying thickness that was left exposed to space in the back of the payload bay. When Columbia returned, the foil could be carefully studied for holes and pitting to see what sort of micrometeorite activity could be expected on future flights. There were also experiments dedicated to studying the interaction between the shuttle environment and the space environment. I've mentioned before how there's more air than you might think in low Earth orbit, but calling it air is sort of a stretch at this altitude. The individual molecules are extremely far apart compared to air that's at sea level, and a lot of it is in a state of matter known as plasma. Plasma is basically just a gas where the electrons and atomic nuclei have been separated, so now the whole thing carries a charge. If you thought it was tricky predicting how gas would behave normally, you know, the entire field of aerodynamics, just wait until you throw electricity in there. Now you're in the impressively named realm of magnetohydrodynamics. The Vehicle Charging and Potential experiment would study the electric charge generated by the orbiter as well as its interaction with the thin plasma present in this region of space. One more plasma experiment was the Plasma Diagnostics Package. This was another instrument that would be sort of waved around on the Canadarm in order to study the environment around the orbiter up to about 50 feet out. But this one was especially looking at the plume emitted by the shuttle's outgassing and how it interacted with the plasma. The shuttle leaves a wake through the plasma, just like a boat moving through water, and that could have all sorts of potential electrical effects that needed to be understood. The last type of experiment that we'll be talking about is more of an engineering test. One of these tests, the thermal canister experiment, evaluated different thermal control technologies with an eye towards simplifying future payloads. Another, officially called small self-contained payloads, but usually referred to as getaway specials, was designed to make it easier for groups outside of NASA to fly shuttle payloads. This was basically a small standardized container that could house an experiment without a lot of fuss. The idea here was that groups such as universities or companies could easily fly a small payload and see how it behaved in space. The concept sort of reminds me of today's CubeSats, but before CubeSats existed. In this case, the container had stuff like microphones and thermal sensors so that NASA could tell interested parties what sort of environment to expect. Flying this mission, like all of the orbital test flights, would be a crew of two. Riding in the left seat and serving as commander was Jack Lausma. Lausma is perhaps best known, or at least his voice is, as the voice of Capcom during the initial crisis aboard Apollo 13. But we also know him from his 59-day stint aboard Skylab, serving as the pilot of Skylab 3. In fact, during that mission, he ran an experiment similar to this mission's plasma diagnostics package. This is his second and final flight. Joining Lausma would be Gordon Fullerton. With the Skylab mission gone and Fred Hayes also gone, I'm sure Fullerton was delighted to be flying so early in the program. Charles Gordon Fullerton was born on October 11, 1936 in Rochester, New York. Fullerton earned Bachelor and Master of Science degrees in Mechanical Engineering from Caltech in 1957 and 1958 before joining the Air Force. There, he flew the F-86 and B-47 before attending the Air Force Test Pilot School out at Edwards. He was serving as a test pilot in the Bomber Operations Division at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base when the Manned Orbiting Laboratory came calling in 1966. Fullerton worked on MOL until its cancellation in 1969, joining NASA as part of Astronaut Group 7 later that year. We last saw him flying alongside Fred Hayes in Enterprise as part of the approach and landing tests. This was his first of two space flights. On March 22, 1982, just a few weeks before the first anniversary of STS-1, Columbia was ready to fly for a third time. And for the last time, I get to jabber on about the paint on the external tank. I feel like I've driven this point into the ground, but when I first heard about it, my mind was blown that the tank used to be white, so I can't help it. Anyway, the tank is no longer white, 
saving about 800 pounds in paint weight. The launch window lasted just over six hours, with one hour being used up by a minor delay related to ground equipment. At 11 a.m. local time, Columbia fired up again and once more leapt off of launch pad 39A. Ascent proceeded with no major issues, though I'm sure some heart rates were raised when the DPDT alarm sounded. Since apparently NASA can't just call the alarm that sounds when there's a sudden change in pressure a leak alarm, it's called DPDT, as in change in pressure per change in time. The alarm turned out to be a false alarm, caused by the slight expansion of the cockpit as the ambient pressure outside dropped. Later flights would raise the threshold to prevent similar false positives. The crew also noticed that a few tiles were missing from the nose of the orbiter just outside the windshield. While I'm sure seeing pieces of your spacecraft missing right in front of you wasn't the most welcome sight, mission controllers determined that it posed no serious safety threat. One other item of note during ascent was that one of the two SRBs had one of its three main parachutes fail, resulting in a rougher splashdown than expected. Just under nine minutes after liftoff, the engine shut down, the external tank was jettisoned, and Lausma and Fullerton were on their way. Once on orbit, both astronauts were stricken with a bout of the dreaded space sickness. This must have been especially frustrating for Jack Lausma, since he and the rest of the Skylab 3 crew had similar trouble back in 1973, leading to pretty serious schedule setbacks. It also must have been frustrating because both men were taking anti-nausea medication to try to prevent this very problem. Space sickness is obviously not great if for no other reason than who enjoys feeling nauseous, but especially on these short early shuttle flights, it can have a major impact on a mission. When you're only up there for seven days and you spend three of them trying not to puke, you've put a serious dent in your productivity. So as the payload bay door motors churned outside, the crew tried to ignore their stomachs churning inside and got to work. Much of their work revolved around the lengthy list of payloads I rattled off earlier, as well as the usual spacecraft housekeeping. But in addition to physical experiments that characterized the shuttle environment, the crew was also tasked with some special procedures to characterize the shuttle's response to space. One important question to answer was how the orbiter responded to different thermal conditions. With that in mind, a number of activities were designed to put the orbiter through some mildly stressful thermal conditions and see how it responded. While the crew went about their business, the orbiter was left to bask in the sun in a number of different attitudes. And since it's been a while and I've been laying on the jargon pretty thick lately, remember that attitude just means which way the spacecraft is pointing. Columbia varied its attitude throughout the mission, spending 10 hours with the payload bay facing the sun, 30 hours with the tail facing the sun, 80 hours with the nose facing the sun, and 26 hours with the payload bay facing the sun, but this time maintaining an inertial attitude. But what's sort of confusing about that to me is that an inertial attitude is specifically called out in that last bit, which seems to imply that the other attitudes were non-inertial. By inertial attitude, they mean that the shuttle was not rotating as it went around in its orbit. That is, if you were magically standing still in space and watching, you'd see it go round and round in its orbit while constantly pointing in the same direction. As opposed to something like flying in local vertical, local horizontal mode, constantly slowly rotating to keep one side facing the Earth. So the best I can tell is perhaps Columbia was in a passive thermal control role when in nose-to-sun and tail-to-sun mode, that is, very slowly spinning along its long axis. And the only non-inertial payload bay to sun attitude that I can think of is yawing around the line from the shuttle to the sun. So if you were the sun, you'd see the top of the shuttle facing you as it slowly rotated like a clock. Why is this important? Well, it's not at all important, but every once in a while, I get really hung up on some little detail when writing the show, and for once, I wanted to bring you all into the madness. One sort of neat thing to note here is that while in the nose-to-sun or tail-to-sun orientations, the windows in the back of the flight deck started to get a little condensation on them. The reason was that with the nose or tail pointing towards the sun, the payload bay was in shadow and got pretty cold, chilling the windows. And just in case you doubted mission control, the condensation was predicted well in advance. 
One more thermal test took place partway through the mission when the Ohm's engines were fired up after a long, cold soak to see how they'd handle it. I'm guessing that this took place during the nose-to-sun mode when the tail was in darkness, but I didn't run that one down. The Ohm's engine did just fine, setting aside another potential future concern. While Lausma and Fullerton waved the robot arm around and introduced the orbiter to attitude gymnastics, some basic earthly concerns began to impact their mission. The weather. For these early test flights, NASA wanted the shuttle pilots to have nothing but wide open areas to land in. With that in mind, Columbia was to once again land on the dry lake bed at Edwards Air Force Base. The dry lake bed presented a nice, stable, flat surface that went on for miles and miles in every direction. Perfect for a stress-free landing. The only problem was, it wasn't dry anymore. Even in the desert, it rained sometimes, and rain had followed up the lake bed and flooded the runways. Landing in a muddy lake bed isn't great, just ask Neil Armstrong from his pre-astronaut days, so Edwards was not going to work. STS-3 was going to have to land somewhere else. One possibility was the shuttle landing facility at the Kennedy Space Center. The shuttle landing facility is a monster-sized runway that goes on for almost three miles. But Lausma and Fullerton had done a lot of training at a different landing site and opted for that instead. The White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. You know what they say, spring showers bring... Columbia to White Sands. But during the mission, the weather threw an additional curveball, with high winds at White Sands whipping up enough dust to create a visibility problem. So STS-3 got to stay on orbit for an extra day. Something tells me the astronauts weren't about to complain. When landing day did arrive, everything was ready to go. The Ohm's engines performed the deorbit burn, and Columbia assumed the entry attitude. Re-entry is considered to start at entry interface, a somewhat arbitrary line at 400,000 feet, or 75 miles, or 122 kilometers, or 606 furlongs, or whatever, that marked where the atmosphere was going to start being a problem. As Columbia slipped past entry interface, it had 4,760 miles left to fly before reaching the runway. Well, a few S-turns and 4,760 miles later, Lausma eased Columbia down for a nice, gentle landing at 5.7 feet per second. And in doing so, STS-3 earned a place in history as the only shuttle mission to land somewhere other than the Kennedy Space Center or Edwards Air Force Base. Despite missing a couple of tiles from launch, OV-102 was no worse for wear, though later inspection did spot nearly 200 small dings and chips in the delicate thermal protection system caused either during the mission or by bits of desert kicked up from landing. Those were easy enough to fix, but Columbia's stay at White Sands also resulted in a longer-lasting legacy. Dust. It seems that the especially fine dust at White Sands was so invasive that they could never quite get it all out of the shuttle. Astronaut and future NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden said that even up to its final mission 21 years later, they were still finding dust from White Sands in Columbia. Next time, it's time to put a bow on the orbital test flights. Columbia would fly again as STS-4 hoped to provide the last data required to declare the space shuttle operational. And just wait till you hear this funny story I found about a classified payload checklist and a safe. You've never heard anything like it. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass.